Aloha, and welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living. I'm Richard Emery. I'm your host today, and we're going to be talking about parliamentary procedure. But let me just kind of outline how this show is going to go. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of parliamentary procedure and some of the basics uh, for the first half of the show. And then the last half, which will be very interesting to some of you, we're going to talk about three or four actual meetings that occurred. And for example, how one association had to pay an owner and reimburse them his legal fees of $350,000 for violating, uh, I'm going to say, parliamentary procedure. So we're going to talk about some of the worst case uh, issues that have happened in Hawaii. And then maybe end up we have time, I hope we do, on some three or four helpful tips because. In Hawaii, in a condo association, the law was changed a couple of years ago, mandating that owners have the right to participate in the deliberations at a board meeting. Now, that doesn't mean they can hold the board hostage and interrupt and keep you from doing your business, but association boards now have to make rules and provide for owners to participate in deliberations. And that doesn't mean you can speak at the forum or the end of the meeting and you can't speak during the meeting. It means for every agenda item, they have the ability to add a few comments. And uh, the way most boards deal with that is they say, uh, okay, we're gonna discuss the item first as a board. And before we vote, we'll give owners a chance to make a comment. And sometimes they limit it to two minutes, but. Uh, often, if it's a small group and uh, you want to be polite to your owners, then they may give them a little more time. But uh, you have the ability to establish rules and to uh, 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 control the participation because it is a business meeting. And you have work to get done, and your volunteers uh, recognize it again. I'm going to repeat that the law says you have to allow them to participate in the deliberations at board meetings, and and I see lots of complaints about that from many, many points of view. But anyway, let me just remind you about parliamentary procedure. You know, meeting rules or procedures go back to the ancient times of the Greeks. And actually in 1812, Thomas Jefferson wrote the first do document called Manual of Parliamentary Practice. But then the most well-known of all is Henry Martin Roberts, who in 1876 uh, wanted to publish procedure rules or parliamentary procedure. And he was a Brigadier General retired in the United States Army. And the word parliament comes from the English parliament. You know, parliamentary comes from the English word parliament. But he was a student of procedure. And so he wrote the first Robert's Rules of Order in 1876, which is about 156 pages long. And today we're in the 12th edition, which is 633 pages long. And I'll explain that in a minute, but uh, it's certainly come a long way. And uh, uh, it, it's quite complicated to be candid with you because it covers all the types of meetings that may exist. So it's not just a board meeting or your annual meeting of uh, members of the, the homeowner association or, or condo association. So that's, that's quite diverse. But a lot of people don't really understand is that beside Robert's Rules of Order, there's Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure, which is used by most state legislatures. There's Cushing's Manual of Parliamentary Procedure, but certainly the most well-known is Robert's Rules of Order. And let me just tell you a couple of facts. So if you're going to hold a meeting and you want to use parliamentary rules, I'm going to say Robert's rules for the purpose of this uh, show today, you have to ask yourself the number one question. Where does the authority come from? You can have rules. Well, you know, essentially the organization, in this case, let's say a condo association, would establish that Robert's Rules is the parliamentary authority. It's a little different from condos in the sense that there's several state laws, the Nonprofit Corporations Act, the uh, condo law, 
um, the Homeowners Association 421J uh, mandate that Robert's rules be used in meetings. And there's some other laws here in the state as well. So the standard for condos by state law is, is um, Robert's rules of order. So you can't use Cushing's rules of order. But anyway, um, the whole idea behind that though is to understand that any organization has to have some authority to have parliamentary rules. So if it's a brand new organization, a uh, nonprofit, let's say, they could set up standing rules and say our parliamentary authority is Robert's Rules of Order. And so there's got to be that authority. And what I want to share with you what I think the basics of Robert's Rules are, what I call the three fundamental principles of Robert's Rules of Order. The first Number one principle is what I call, this is my opinion, by the way, authority. As I explained to you, you have to have some authority to have parliamentary rules. But it goes beyond that. You have to have some authority within your charter or your declaration of what the organization stands for. And that Declaration in the case of a condo or the bylaws, which is a, a part of the declaration, defines what the board's authority is. And so you don't have the ability to do whatever you want. You have to be operating your condo association within the authority that was vested in the declaration of bylaws. You don't have the ability to do anything you want. You have to do things within your legal authority. And Sometimes you may, as a board, have legal authority dependent upon somebody else, like the homeowner's approval, like borrowing money, for example. So the most number one thing I see people make mistakes on is taking action when they don't have the authority to take action. You know, and, and, and they put themselves in harm's way illegally. And I'm going to give you an example of that exact situation after the break. Uh, by go through these three or four uh, cases, you you may have a hard time believing. I may I may put them on a reality TV show. It's so interesting. But anyway, the second fundamental principle of Robert's rules, to me, is keeping order. You want to have a meeting that is efficient. Everybody gets to be heard. You have proper voting or uh, other conduct as prescribed in in the bylaws, and. So you can have keep order so people know when they can speak, can't speak, everybody's treated equally, so that one person can't monopolize the meeting, and the meeting runs efficiently so you can accomplish your business. And the third fundamental principle, which is often overlooked, and I'll use some examples after the break, it was what I call Robert Rules protects the minority. The rules are established to protect the minority. And I'll get into that with some examples uh, again after the break. One thing I mentioned to you earlier is that Robert's Rules is now 633 pages. Well, you have to understand that Robert's Rules, the current 12th edition, and some people say, Where, who, who, who decides in the new editions? And in the old days, it used to be the uh, ancestors and the appointed parliamentarians of expertise by the family. I, I think Robert, uh, uh, he was his name, Henry Robert, Mar Henry Martin Robert, uh, uh, the last descendant with his name died in 2012. But they have people who are appointed by the family, for lack of a better word, because they certainly own all the rights to the books and everything else to review these things on a regular basis and, and, and makes adjustments. And a good example would be uh, what do we do about electronic meetings? We didn't have Zoom back in 1876. So, I mean, uh, they're updated to meet current operating conditions and current things that go on. But when you look at meetings, you know, there's all sorts of meetings. There's mass meetings. What if, the, what if it's the organization, it's the first time they've ever met, they don't even have a chairman or any standing rules. I mean, there's a procedure. Well, what if it's a convention where you have elected delegates and sometimes delegates get substituted? We don't see that in the condo world, but Robert's Rules deals with conventions as well. Then you're going to have member meetings, and sometimes those are regular meetings, like we have our annual meeting, and sometimes they're special meetings. 
where the members himself or the maybe the board president or the board is called a meeting, a special meeting is to accomplish a specific purpose of business. Then you have committee and board meetings uh, that you have to deal with. And, and um, so, you know, the, that's why Robert's Rules is so big now, because there's so many different types of meetings. And, and certainly uh, they've learned over time uh, all the different things that can go wrong. And they've uh, updated what, what, what things are and those types of things. But what I want to remind you of is that if you look at Robert's Rules, it's a very formal document. You know, the, the chair of the meeting has to be standing. He has to read the motion to the assembly. You know, if you want to speak, you have to rise and stand and be recognized. Well, what people don't realize is that within Robert's Rules, a section called Rules for Small Boards. And that's like a board of directors meeting. And all of these formalities go by the wayside for lack of a better purpose, in the sense that number one, you can sit there in a meeting and you don't even have to have a motion on a table. You can discuss a topic. If everybody's generally in agreement, it's, it's obvious that everybody's in agreement. You can say, okay, everybody agree, okay, let's pass unanimously. You don't have to go through some of that formality of standing and being recognized and the motion has to be in writing and things. Because the rules for small boards are you're, you're a small group, usually defined as less than 12 persons. And they have less formality with regard to that. Recognize it in Hawaii state law. If you do have a vote on something and it's not unanimous, then the minutes are required to define what each director, how they voted for or against uh, uh, the thing. Which is kind of interesting because I see a common uh, mistake is pretend you have nine board members and you have a vote, the vote is five in favor, three opposed, and one abstention. Well, abstentions don't count as somebody voting. So uh, technically speaking, it would be a vote of eight people, five in favor, and three opposed. And the abstentions go by the wayside, although I don't think there's any harm if people put the abstentions in the, in the meetings. But technically speaking, uh, that's probably not, not correct. So. It's, it's, it's a much simpler process, kind of the way most boards operate today. They sit around the room, they uh, talk story about what they have to do. There's usually an order of business. You know, they have a presiding chair, president probably of the board, and they have a quorum. Do we have a quorum of the board? Important to recognize that if you have a board of nine and the quorum is five, you need to look at your bylaws to see if um, what it takes to adopt a resolution or a motion. It may be you need five of nine, so if you only have seven people there, you still need five people to vote for it. Or you may be a majority of the quorum, which would be of seven, four, three need to vote for it. But that's going to be defined in your bylaws. But someone's got to be careful to make sure when you do things that you're properly adopting any, any motions that take place. So it's clear and it's pretty much everybody understands um, that's kind of how it works. Now we're getting close to the break. I get to talk about the exciting things. I do want to just say briefly before we take the break that the agenda is usually established by the chair, but has to be agreed upon by the people in attendance. So anybody, and I say attendance, I'm talking about members of the board in this case, not member, uh, owners sitting in the audience. And so they would have to, they could say, I'd like to amend the agenda and add this new item to the agenda, or I'd like to modify the agenda and take our guest speaker first. So. He just has to sit here through all of our meetings. So anyway, we're at the halfway point, and I want to encourage you to stay with me because we're going to talk about some exciting cases and how it represents parliamentary procedure right after our one-minute break.
I'm back, and I hope uh, you're excited as I am to talk about some of these cases. You know, it's a short show, so it's hard to talk about motions, and they have different priorities. Uh, you may not know what the highest priority motion is, what we call a motion to adjourn. It's a Motions are debatable or not debatable, and they're amendable or not amendable. And the motion to adjourn is, to me, the highest ranking motion. It's not debatable, not amendable. Has to it requires an immediate vote, and it only takes a majority of the people uh, in attendance at the meeting to adjourn the meeting. So, if you're in the middle of counting the votes of the election, and someone stands up and says, "I move to adjourn," it's it's a high priority main motion that trumps everything else going on in the meeting, and you have to do a vote and adjourn. And so, what happens to the vote count in that case? Well, what happens is it's suspended until the next meeting. It's unfinished business. So uh, granted, it's gonna take half the people to get really excited and want to adjourn the meeting. I was actually at a, my first story, was I was at an annual meeting where uh, it was a relatively new project with a developer and it was a conversion, so they had its own baggage. And the large group of owners didn't like the developer's plans and they were gonna elect directors and things like that. And instead of, trying to adjourn the meeting. They didn't have a majority, so they wouldn't have been successful. They made another tactic. They all of a sudden, in the middle of the vote count, stood up and said, we're leaving, you no longer have a quorum, and walked out the door. Well, quorums, you have to have a quorum throughout the entire meeting. You can't have a quorum in the beginning and then lose the quorum and continue business. So we had like 300 people there. So we had to have everybody go out of their room, everybody check back in again. And then we determined that we did have a quorum even with them leaving. And so the meeting continued, but that shows you under uh, parliamentary procedure. I guess we should see it with filibusters and all this stuff on the legislative side that you can really have some interesting times with kind of stuff. But let me tell you a story about authority. There was a condo I should say a homeowner association that had seven condos in it as a part of this master association. And they wanted to amend their bylaws to restrict vacation rentals instead of 30 days, which was in the existing document, to 180 days. So they went and they put out a document to amend the bylaws and it failed. They couldn't get enough people to uh, support it. So the president of that board said, you know, we have seven condos who belong to this. Each condo has one member of the board. I think you have the right to vote for all the people who didn't vote because they elected you to represent them. So I think you have the right to vote for all these people who didn't vote on this bylaw amendment. And he talked them into voting for the bylaw amendment and then stated the amendment passed but one of the owners and it's very well off, you know, average homes like five million bucks, said, I don't know how you can do that. And uh, I don't accept it. And so what they did was they wanted to enforce it. They appointed an employee who they named Sheriff and they had him go knock on that guy's door first because he was suing them. And young lady answers the door and the guy who's the employee says, I'm the sheriff of this place. I need to see your rental agreement. She said, I don't have a rental. Agreement. And he says, well, how long are you here for? And she said, about a month. And he says, you can't be here for a month. That's against the rules. She shrugged her whole shoulders and closed the door. So then they filed a uh, fine on him and a suit against him. The problem was that that was his daughter who he's letting use the home for free. So I went to binding arbitration and the arbitrating panel ruled the following. A, you can't vote for somebody else. Pretty common sense. I mean, uh, I don't believe that someone could do this, but they did. I saw it. So you can't vote for someone else. So this amendment you say is passed is moot and void and not enforceable. But then they said, your conduct towards this owner and your violation of your duty, we're going to make you repay back his legal fees, which were $350,000. So... You could make an argument against the board and saying, did you breach your fiduciary duty? You didn't follow the business judgment rule. Did that be an expense of the association? 
are you personally liable as a board member for voting for when you could have gotten legal advice? You could have done a lot of things before you went down that road. So that's example number one about make sure you have the authority to do something. You know, the suggestion you have the authority to vote for somebody else and you're going to read through the lines and cross the T's and dot the I's and make up your own rules is probably not a good idea. Example number two. A private club, actually, it, it's not a condo, uh, was doing some renovations to its clubhouse. And they had the authority in the bylaws of the board to make the decision. But to borrow the money, they needed the member's approval. And they went out and got the member's approval by a mail ballot. Well, a few owners, members, didn't like this because it was changing things they had fallen in love with and were longtime members. And so they decided to call a special meeting. And the purpose of the special meeting was to have an update report on the renovation of the clubhouse. And under their bylaws, you see, they only needed 50, 25 people for the petition, 50 people out of 700 at the meeting. The majority of those at the meeting could make and take action. So their objective was to go into that meeting and rescind the authority for the loan. Now, here's the problem. First of all, remember I said the fundamental principle of Robert's rules is protect the minority. When this came up before, after they had the presentation, the president, when, they, when the guy says, I'm gonna make a motion, and the president said, it's out of order. Well, why is it out of order? Because a notice restricts what you're gonna do and you said you wanted a report, you didn't say you're going to vote on anything. And, and the idea behind that is I could have been a member theoretically, and I read the call of the meeting, oh, I'm already aware of everything that's going on, I don't want to go hear a report. Or if I knew they were going to vote, I might have shown up. So it's important to have transparency to make sure that um, the people are told so they can decide for themselves when they show up or not. So it was ruled out of order, and they couldn't vote on anything. Let's just pretend for a moment they had put in there a uh, vote and rescind the motion on the loan. The problem then becomes under Robert's rules, if you have a motion that's been adopted and you want to rescind it, and action has already been taken on that motion, meaning they signed the loan agreement, they signed the contract to remodel the clubhouse, you don't have the authority to rescind it anymore. You know, the difference between rescind and reconsider is reconsider a motion is in the same meeting. Rescind is at a subsequent meeting, kind of the same thing in a way, but rescinding is when you're done at a later meeting, but you can't rescind things where actions have already been taken. Now there's exceptions to everything I say, by the way, so I'm trying to give you a, trying to give you a, a, a general a view on that. Another example would be another homeowner association. I haven't had have be the chairman of this, uh, the president at the time. And we were amending the bylaws, we'd given notice, we had, uh, uh, people show up and, and that's this meeting of 2,500 people. We only had 40 people show up. And there were 20 people who hated the bylaw amendment who were primarily resident owner occupants. And then there were 20 other people there who were more resort owners who liked the amendment. And so they asked for a parliamentary inquiry. We had a parliamentarian, great parliamentarian. And saying, how do we stop this from happening? He said, make a motion to defer indefinitely the motion adopting the bylaws. And so that's what they did. They were all excited. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna try taking uh, a rising hands vote. You know, it's like stand up and you raise your hand. And of course, I didn't know who was the wife and the husband. I didn't really care, as you'll find out in a minute. So anyway, um, uh, I said, all in favor of uh, deferring indefinitely, about 20 hands went up. Then I said, all in favor of not deferring and definitely continuing, about 20 hands went up. So in my wisdom, I said, okay, I'm going to rule that the motion to defer fail. And of course, they went ballistic. How can you do that? I said, well, let me explain it to you. I have 1,600 proxies as the president. And you notice my hand went up to vote against the definite deferral. So the motion has failed and I don't need to have a ballot count 
because I control 1,600 votes. And they railroad you railroad job and stomped out. The bylaws got amended. So, you know, people don't know you have this to defer. The last example really quickly is, um, uh, we have to understand when you make a motion, you want to amend a motion. The amendment has to be germane to the original motion. And I've gone to meetings where they've tried to, uh, they've had a bylaw amendment, they're talking about it, and they want to add another bylaw amendment, but again, they violated the notice provision because in the minutes or, or in the notice of the meeting, it said, we want to amend Article 5, they didn't say about Article 6. So it has to be germane. And they said, well, it's germane to the bylaws. It's the bylaws. The fact is protecting the minority. People have a right to know what is going to be discussed at a meeting and participate under certain circumstances under Hawaii State Law for condos to make sure these things happen. So I would just tell you that parliamentary procedure is very important to running a good meeting. And my basic summary of my quick one-minute things you need to do to consider having a good meeting would be as follows on my notes. Know your authority. Follow the business judgment rule in your dealing. Take action in meetings. Don't continue to defer thing month after month after month. Recognize that the people at the meeting may not represent everybody's thoughts and views. You still have to take action as the board being responsible for your association. And when necessary, rely on professionals to get advice, like an architect or a lawyer, to make sure you're, you're, you're taking fundamentally good business judgment kind of rules. And that's kind of my short summary of Robert's Rules of Order, which is much better than Richard's Rules of Disorder. That's me, Richard. So I would suggest you take heed, run good meetings, be transparent, encourage people to get involved. But at the end of the day, you need parliamentary authority, you need to make decisions, and you need to be careful not to put yourself in harm's way by uh, thinking you have authority you don't have, or thinking you don't need to protect the minority. Anyway, aloha, hope you learned something today, and look forward to seeing you again on Condo Insider.